Monday night. And I appreciate the goodness of the Lord, appreciate the kindness of his people. And the preacher took me out and fed me today. And we had a good time of fellowship. I love being around him. And uh, he's excited about the things of God. And I like that. And uh, we uh, got to fellowship some. And then got a little rest this afternoon. And I remember when I was, uh, I remember when I was a boy, a little boy, they wanted me to take a nap. And I never wanted to. Now I want to. <laughs> Amen. But, uh, but, uh, so I got me a little nap, so that, that helps me along the way. John chapter 4. We'll try something a little unusual tonight and preach out of the New Testament for a change. A fellow said to me last week, he said, don't you ever preach out of the New Testament? And I said, on occasion. So this will be one of those occasions. John chapter number 4. I appreciate also the uh, preacher and his wife went out and got me some stuff over there. I'm staying over at uh, Brother Sutherland's and one of the prophet's children. Very comfortable there. They went out and got me some things and I appreciate that very much. John chapter number four. We'll read a few verses here and I will emphasize the word and then look at some truth around it. In John chapter four and uh, let's start in verse one. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. So Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria, to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, from whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up, into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art, thou art a prophet, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, thou the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto Him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When He is come, He will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. And upon this came His disciples and marveled that He talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Let's pray a moment. Father, we love you tonight because you first loved us. We are thankful to be gathered together with the saints. We're thankful for the word of God, for the fellowship of believers, for the songs of Zion. We're thankful, Lord, for the sweet Holy Spirit who speaks to our hearts. Help us now, I pray, get glory unto yourself in the service tonight. 
Lord, if you get glorified, we'll get help. So you help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to, I want you to notice when Jesus spoke to this woman in verse number 21, I want you to notice what he called her. And it's what the Bible will call her throughout this portion of Scripture. But Jesus uses this term in verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me. Now he called her woman. I was looking at that passage and that word, and I began to look in my Bible, and I found in my Bible, in the Gospels, five times that Jesus referred to a woman with that title. He called her woman. Uh, some, want, some of them had names, but he did not call them by their name on that particular occasion. He called them woman. Now, the term woman here is not a term of derision. It is not a term of anger, but it is normally a term of respect. Uh, and so Jesus is speaking to this woman, and he calls her woman. Now, five times. There are four women. One of them he called woman twice. Uh, Mary, his mother, he called her woman on two occasions at the marriage supper of Cana and then when he was hanging on the cross. I like to call her, and those titles, I like to call her the woman that never wavered. We find her at the beginning, and we find her at the end. We need some women who do not waver. They'll stay by the stuff. And then the adulteress in John chapter 8, Jesus called her woman. He said, Woman, where are thine accusers? Doth no man condemn thee? She said, No man, Lord. He said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now let me stop and just say this. So he said, Preacher, why is it Jesus would say to that woman who had committed adultery, why would he say to her, neither do I condemn thee? Well, here's what he did. He said, let him that was out sin cast the first stone. And so none of them could cast the stone at her. What he was doing was he was vetting the witnesses. He was questioning the witnesses, and he found out that not a single witness had the capacity or was or, or could uh, witness against her because they were all guilty. So all the witnesses were dismissed. And it left just him and her. And then he said to her, where are thine accusers? You remember what Moses said? He said in the mouth of two or three witnesses. You had to have two or three witnesses to have a stoning. There were no witnesses left except Jesus. So what he did, he got her case thrown out of court. I want to say this to you. That's what Jesus did for me. He got my case thrown out of court. Amen. And so she is the woman who had no witnesses. Then after his resurrection, when Mary came, uh, the Bible said she was weeping. And three times the Bible mentions her weeping, Mary Magdalene. I call her the woman who is noticed for her weeping. And all of her weeping was the result of supposition. Uh, the Bible said she supposed, supposing him to be the gardener. And all the weeping that Mary was doing at the resurrection was because she had she looked at things wrong. If she had looked at them in a scriptural sense, she would have been rejoicing. But she was supposing some things. And uh, I call her the woman who was noticed for her weeping. But this is the woman I want to deal with tonight for a little while. And I'm going to call her tonight the woman that nobody wanted. The woman that nobody wanted. I wonder how often you and I that are saved, that know the love of Christ, that know what it's like to be accepted in the Beloved, who know what it's like to have our sins forgiven, to be born again, to have a home in heaven. I wonder how often it is we realize how many people there are in this world who, whether they are or not unwanted, they feel unwanted, they seem to be unwanted, and nobody much cares about them. I'm glad to know that Jesus cares about us. Amen. The Bible said, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And it doesn't matter how you feel, Jesus cares for you. He said, be content with such things. Paul said it in Hebrews. I think Brother Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Brother Goolsby did not agree with me on that, but he knows them right now. Amen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, he said, uh, be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm glad he cares for us. I'm glad we have a sympathizing Savior. I'm glad the Bible said he is touched uh, with the feelings of our infirmities. So, uh, here, but here is a woman in this passage that it appears there is no one in the world that cares anything about her. 
There's no one around her that wants to have anything to do with her. Here is a woman that most of the world is done with. They are finished with. Whoever used to care about her apparently does not care about her anymore. So she is the woman that nobody wanted. And all around us, we're surrounded by people who feel unwanted and feel uncared for. And so I want to talk to you about that tonight. I'll talk to you about this woman a moment, then I'll talk to you about the Lord Jesus. I want to say to you, first of all, when I look at her, I, I come to this conclusion. Her homeland did not want her. The people where she grew up, the people around her did not want her. She said, well, preacher, how do you know? Well, if you look in the scripture, notice verse number seven. The Bible said, there cometh a woman of Samaria. Then notice verse nine. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? So immediately when we're introduced to this woman three times, we are told she is a woman of Samaria. We are not told what her name is. We're not told who her father was. We're not told who her mother was. We're not told, uh, we're not told how she was raised or anything about her background. All we know about her is that she is a woman of Samaria. Three times we are told that immediately in our text. So I would say to you, first of all, she is an appraised Samaritan. You say, what is it about this woman? Well, here's what somebody would say if they looked at her. Why, wow, she's a Samaritan. That's all she is. She's a Samaritan. That was the appraisal. That, that's the final conclusion about her. The woman of Samaria. That's the foremost truth about her. She is a woman of Samaria. It is more important to her or about her even than her name. It's the one appraisal that keeps coming up. Somebody might look at her and say, what's wrong with her? Uh, why does she do what she does? Why does she live the way she lives? Why is she dressing the way she's dressing? Why does she talk the way she talks? And the answer would always be the same. Because she's a Samaritan. That's what her problem is. She's a Samaritan. I I'll talk to you a moment about the Samaritans before I'm done. But she is an appraised Samaritan. And then I want you to notice this. She is an abandoned Samaritan. Now watch what it says. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour. This is the afternoon. This is the heat of the day. This is the heat of the day when everybody else is sitting at home trying to stay cool. You remember Abraham in his tent in Genesis 18. He sat in the tent at the heat of the day. It was not a time to be out. It was not a time to be out and about. And yet this woman is at the well. Only her and Jesus at the well. Why is she at the well at the hottest part of the day? Why isn't she there in the morning? That's when most women would go and get their water. Why isn't she there in the evening when the sun has gone down and the atmosphere is cool and the, and the breeze will blow? Why is she there in the middle of the day? She's there in the middle of the day most likely because no, she knows no one else will be there. She doesn't want to face anybody. She doesn't want to see the people that she lives with. She doesn't want to see the people of the town. She does not want to have interaction with them. Because I imagine there have been other times she has come to the well. We'll read a little bit about her later, about her lifestyle. I imagine she'd heard some whispers. I imagine she's gotten some sideways glances. I imagine when she comes to the well and the other women are there, they nudge one another and say, there she is. You know her. There she is. I imagine if she tries to speak, they turn their face away from her. She's had enough of it. She comes to the well in the middle of the day so that she will not have to face anyone. She is abandoned. She's not only an appraised Samaritan, an ab abandoned Samaritan, but she is an arrogant Samaritan. That preacher, sure what do you mean? She, though she has been abandoned by the Samaritans, somehow she still has pride in being a Samaritan. A little bit later in the passage, she will say to Jesus in verse 20, Our fathers, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say, can you almost hear the tone of her voice? Our fathers, here's how we were taught. 
here's how we were brought up. Here's how we do it in Samaria. Here's how we are. But then you say, have you ever talked with somebody? Isn't it, isn't it amazing that folks live in sin and they live an ungodly life and those that lived in sin with them have cast them off and they're done with them because the world will use you and then spit you out and yet they still want to cling to sin. They still, you find sometimes they've been, they, everything they have done, they have lived a wicked life, an ungodly life, and it's caught up with them, and yet there is an arrogance and a pride that says, I don't care, I don't care what you say, I don't care what you think, this is the way I've lived, this is the way I was brought up, this is this, this is that, and they're arrogant and angry about it, and she is at the very least arrogant about it. She said, our father. Basically, she's saying, we're right, you're wrong. She's telling that to Jesus. We're right. Our father. And ye say, she is stubbornly clinging to the very people who have turned their back on her. You know what we did when we were sinners? We stubbornly clung to our sin and to our wickedness, even when it had left us with nothing and taken away every good thing out of our life, we stubbornly clung to our sin. So here is a woman, her homeland is done with her. They're not interested in her. Her homeland didn't want her. But secondly, I want you to notice this, the Hebrews didn't want her. The Jews. Preacher, how do you know? Well, watch what she said. In verse number nine, or verse number seven, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away in the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask us drink of me? which I'm a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She knows that. She states it. She's aware of that. How does she know that? Well, most likely she's had some interaction with some Jews somewhere. They didn't treat her very well. John chapter 8 and verse 48, the Jews are, are casting aspersions at the Lord Jesus. And they said this, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and have cast a devil. So in the mind of the Jews, apparently, being a Samaritan and being devilish go hand in hand. And when they want to when they want to make an accusation against the Lord and they want to insult him, the greatest insult that they can think of is, here's what we say about you. You're a Samaritan. Say, boy, we live in a day where there's prejudice and bigotry. There has always been prejudice and bigotry. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. I could go back. We don't have time for it. You go back and find out about the Samaritans and those that did not come into the promised land. We don't have time to go into all of it. But this is a long-standing, deep-seated hatred, and she knows about it. She's aware of it. She knows the prejudice. She's aware of the disdain that the Jews have toward the Samaritans. I, I, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about something my, my, my parents said to me when I was younger, about when I was a boy, about a certain family. And uh, they had gotten in a lot of trouble, their kids. And I remember my mother saying to me, I don't want, you see, I don't want to see you hanging around with that crowd. And she was right. I didn't, need to, I didn't need to be with her because I'd have wound up in trouble too. And I, I'll tell you the truth, I've made enough trouble on my own without any help. But you know, in the day we live, we have this, we have this, I don't, I don't want you playing with them. I don't want you, I don't want you hanging around with them. No, they are not invited. And a lot of it's not based on right and wrong. A lot of it's based on prejudice and bigotry. And it has always been that way with mankind. Mankind always has this thought, somehow I'm better than you are. Somehow you are less than I am. 
so the Hebrews did not want her. She's aware of the disdain that the Jews have, but then notice what happens when the disciples come back. Verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I speak, I speak unto thee and me, and upon this came his disciples. Now watch this, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? Now, are they marveling because she's a woman? Jesus has spoken to woman, women on other times in the Scripture. I think they're marveling because he is speaking to a Samaritan woman. The Jews had this problem, even the disciples. You remember the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus. She said, Jesus, thou, I think it's Matthew 15, Jesus, thou, son of David, have mercy on me, for my daughter is grievously or sore vexed, I forget which word it is, with the devil. And Jesus answered her. The Bible said he answered her not a word. And then <laughs> as they're going along, the disciples look at Jesus. That woman doesn't give up. She is a Gentile, a Canaanite, a, not a Jewish woman. And as they, Jesus will say to her, it's not, it's not meat to give the children's bread to dogs. And she'll say, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the rich man's table. You remember what I'm talking about. But in the midst of that conversation, the disciples say, send her away, for she crieth after us. She wasn't crying after them. She hadn't said one word to them. Every word she'd said was to Jesus. Every, every uh, thing she'd asked for was from Jesus. So what's bothering them? I'll tell you what's bothering them. She's not an Israelite. She's not a Hebrew. She's not one of us. Now they come back. And Jesus is speaking to this Samaritan woman. And they marvel. Now think about that word, marvel. They're astonished about it. They marvel. That's the word where Jesus used when he saw her faith. He marveled. It's a pretty strong word. They were so taken aback that he would even speak to this Samaritan woman. That's how they felt about the Samaritan. Jesus would use this, this prejudice and bigotry in their heart when he gave them the parable of the good Samaritan. And the Bible would emphasize it with the ten lepers and nine of them, none of them came back to save this Samaritan. You know what? I think God wants us to get rid of this prejudice and bigotry that's in our heart. And stop thinking of ourselves better than someone else and someone else less than you and I. So here is the Hebrews. They didn't want her. Lord, help us if we ever in our church say, I don't know if we want those kind of folks here. I'll tell you what we want here. We want sinners. We want sinners lost without God to come and hear the gospel and get born again. Amen. We don't care what their background is or where they came from or what their name is. We're not concerned about that. The Bible said all, I like that word all, don't you? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I like the way Isaiah said it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us. All. I like the way that verse starts with all and it ends with all. We're all sinners, every one of us, and he died for all of us that are sinners. And so since we're all sinners, he died for all of us. we got to get over this business of looking down on one another. We better What we better do is say they're sinners and they need a Savior. So her homeland didn't want her. The Hebrews didn't want her. Thirdly, her husband did not want her. Look what Jesus said. The woman answered and said in verse 17, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. Now, I'm thinking about a woman who's had five husbands, and now she's living with a man that is not her husband. I don't know how you interpret that verse, and I wouldn't fuss with you about it. But it looks to me like she'd been married five times and none of those marriages worked out. And so now she's given up on marriage and just living with a fella without benefit of marriage. So however you want to put that, but that's what he said. Five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. So I'm thinking about that. What does this tell me about this woman? 
Well, the first thing it tells me is she doesn't like to be alone. She does not like to live alone. She does not like to eat or suffer alone. She does not like to spend time alone. So how do you know? Because five times she's been married. She doesn't want to be alone. You know, for the most part, people do not want to be alone. They want to have somebody who will care for them, somebody who will love them, somebody who will take an interest in them. And I'm going to tell you, if we want to win people to Christ, we must take an interest in their life. Sometimes you have to win a friend before you can win a convert. She did not want to be alone. But here's the second thing. She's not able to get along. How do you know? Five husbands. If she'd been married five times, apparently she's hard to live with. Wouldn't you say? I remember Brother Kelly saying one time he'd watch something on the television. I hope I don't get in trouble when I say this, but I've been in trouble before. And there was some woman on there, and she talked about how she'd been married five times, and she's looking for another husband. And Brother Kelly said to me, I saw that thing, and I thought to myself, if you've tried five times and you can't find anybody you can live with, I figure ain't nobody out there to give up. Five times. Why does she keep getting married? Because she doesn't want to be alone. She, in, she has a desire for companionship, but she is not able, apparently, to contribute to a relationship. Can you imagine the heartbreak in this woman's life? We're laughing a little bit, and I'm, I'm joking about it in, in some way, but just think about it. Five times, someone has promised to love her forever. Five times somebody said to her, I'm done with you. I'm through with you. I'm finished with you. One time would be enough. One time would be enough to break your heart. But five times, five times there's been anger. Five times there's been, there's been arguing. Five times there's been abandonment. Five times. I can't imagine the heartache of this woman. You say, well, preacher, what if it was her fault? Whether it's her fault or not, it would still break her heart. I'm glad God loved me even though sin was my fault. I can't blame it on anybody else. He loved me. So she did not want to be alone. She can't get along. And so she has settled for adultery. This is what Jesus said. I'm just taking him at, at what he said. He said, Thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. So five times he called them husband. So five times, however they would go about it, if there was some semblance of community recognition about it. I don't know if they had a ceremony. I don't know, but five times they, Jesus recognized a husband five times, but the man she has now, he does not recognize as her husband. That he's not your husband. So apparently they're living together outside of marriage. She has settled for a purely physical relationship with no commitment. She's finally said, okay, I've tried five times to get somebody to love me and to stand by me, and it hasn't worked, so I'm done with that. I'm just going to satisfy the lust of the flesh. No husband wants her. Or maybe the man she's living with said to her, okay, but I won't marry you because I know your history. I don't know what was said. Jesus doesn't tell us what was said. But it's obvious her husbands did not care for her. Not anymore. So here's a woman. Her homeland didn't want her. The Hebrews didn't want her. Her husbands didn't want her. And I'm saying to you, all around us are people just like this woman. But nobody cares. David said, I, I looked on my right hand. Refuge failed me. He said, no man cares. For my soul. But here's a woman. You want to see people like this woman. You shop with people like this woman. You go 
own school with people like this. We interact with people like this woman every day. But we're not so with this woman. And Jesus saved her. Because here's the thing. Her homeland didn't want her. Her Hebrews didn't want her. The husbands didn't want her. The heaven wanted her. The holy son of God still wanted her. In spite of her arrogance, in spite of her sin, in spite of bigotry and prejudice, in spite of all of her failures, and in spite of the very fact that at that very moment she's living in adultery, Jesus still loved her. Aren't you glad Jesus loves sinners? Aren't you glad he loves us right where we are? It's not a matter of, boy, if you get cleaned up and come. No, it's a matter of just come. I'm glad the prodigal son didn't have to find a place to wash the hog pen off him before he could go home. I'm glad he just got up out of the hog pen and headed for the house. And as soon as he got there, the father took the best robe and put it on him, covering up uh, all the old rags and put the ring on his finger and the shoes uh, on his feet and killed the fatted calf and said, This my son was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he was found. Aren't you glad when you came to Christ, he didn't say, now you go clean that up, you go straighten that up, you go fix that mess, and then you come back. He said, no, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I know there's repentance. I know there's sorrow over sin. I know there is a there is a an admission that I am guilty. But he didn't tell me I had to clean it all up. He didn't tell me I had to straighten my life out. He didn't tell me that. He said, "Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden." I'm glad that the word of the gospel is come, come. You come. God will save you. He'll do the cleaning up. You do the changing. The Bible does not say if any man wants to be in Christ, he must become a new creature. The Bible said if any man is in Christ, if he's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Old, all things have become new. I didn't get cleaned up till I got saved. I didn't get cleaned up to get saved. I got saved. Remember what? Remember what? Ephesians. We always quote Ephesians two eight nine, but we leave out verse ten. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. I know faith without works is dead, but you can't work yourself into faith. You must believe, and then when you believe, then the good works come. And they are the work of God in us. They follow salvation. So here is Jesus he wants her just like she is. Come as you are. Amen. That's the, that's the mantra of today. Come as you are. And I know what they mean by it, but here's what I mean by it. You come as a sinner. I want you to notice something tucked right in the middle of this passage. Look in verse number 10. Watch what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would give thee, have given thee living water. Think about what he just said. He said, If thou knewest the gift of God, if you knew what you need, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, If thou knew, if you knew what you need, Thou wouldest have asked of him if you knew what you needed and you knew who had it to give and you come to him and ask. He would have given thee living water. I said, Preacher, what is this business of salvation? Do you know what you need? Do you know who has it to give? Are you willing to get it from him? Then he'll give it to you. Pretty simple, isn't it? When I got saved, I knew what I needed. I was a sinner. I couldn't get my life straightened out. I couldn't get things. I couldn't get victory over things. I was a sinner. I found out 
there was somebody who could help me with my sin. And so I asked him. I, I told him I was a sinner. I asked him to forgive me my sin. And you know what he did? He forgave me of my sin. Pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. Some say, well, preacher, I don't, how, what are the words? It's not the words. It's what's in your heart. It's what's in your heart. As I believed and therefore have I spoken is what, what Paul said in Corinthians. It's what's in your heart. So here is a woman. Jesus wants her. Nobody else does. I thought about this verse. I preached on it here before. In Amos 3.12, thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd, now think about this, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear. Now, I know what the Lord's speaking about in the context there. He's talking about judgment coming upon, upon Judah or Israel. I don't remember which one it is. But judgment coming on the people of God. But this to me is a very strange statement. As the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear. That's a strange statement. David said, thy, ser thy servant kept my father's sheep, and a lion and a bear came and took the lamb. David said, I smote it and delivered it out of his mouth, and he rose up against me, and I smote him, and I slew him. I can understand David going and taking a live lamb that's in the lion's mouth. But all that's left here is two legs and a piece of an ear in the lion's mouth. But this fellow's going to go and rescue two legs and a piece of an ear out of the lion's mouth. Why? He didn't, he didn't go in the lair where the lion was. He didn't find the leavings of the lion. He said he taketh out of the mouth. He had to fight the lion for two legs and a piece of an ear. All I can think is, he must love that sheep. He must have absolutely loved that sheep. And all that was left was two legs and a piece of an ear, and he was willing to fight that lion and take it out of his mouth. And I'm going to tell you, that's just the way it was with me. There wasn't much left of me but two legs and a piece of the ear. The devil had chewed me up, but the Lord fought the lion for what was left. You say, you look around and say, well, ain't much left of so-and-so. Jesus loves them, and he wants them. Whatever's left. Whatever's left. Two legs and a piece of an ear. That's not much. There's a lot of people whose lives, if you look at their lives, there's just not much left. But heaven wants them. The good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. I remember one time I had a friend, he pastored in Kentucky, and there was a man in the church, who, or I mean a man in the town, who was known as the meanest man in the town. He was a motorcycle uh, gangster, and he had a motorcycle gang. Nobody would mess with him. Nobody was afraid with him. His life was a mess. He was drunk in a dope addict. He had in his religion a trailer and had, his, had a ramp that would go up into the trailer. He'd ride his bike, his motorcycle, up that ramp into the living room, fall off that bike onto the couch, never locked his door, never had to. Nobody was scared to death of him. Nobody would mess with him. So the preacher went to see him. He found him at home and found him sober and talked to him about the Lord. He cussed the preacher and cursed him, said, I don't need God. I don't, I don't know what I would have done there. But the preacher looked at him in the eye and said, you're a coward. I don't know if I'd say that to the meanest man in town. He said, you're just a coward. He said, what do you mean a coward? He said, you're afraid to come to church. You're afraid what you're afraid to he said, I'm not afraid of anybody. He said, then come to church, you fool. So he came to church. Guess what happened? God got through that. And a piece of an ear. When you look and say there isn't much left, God said, I want that. I want that. He paid attention to her. He was aware of her. He gave her what she needed. And you know what she got? Here's what she said. She said, come see a man who's told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? What did what did, uh, what did did Philip say to the Ethiopian? What did he say to him? He said, if I believe, 
If thou believest, thou mayest. He said, Here is water. What doth hinder me, hinder me to be baptized? He said, If thou believest, thou mayest. He said, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what she believed. I believe she got saved. I believe she got right. She became a testimony. She went out and told him. She said, she went out and told them, she said, come see a man which told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Now think about what she got. What did she get now? Jesus got hold of her, and what did she get? She got, first of all, a homeland where she'll always be welcome. She's going to go to heaven. She's there right now. She's in heaven. She won't ever be, nobody will turn their back on her. Nobody will whisper about her. Nobody, no, you know what they'll do in heaven. Uh, she'll say, well, here's what I was, and God saved me. They'll say, yep, that's what we were. They'll all be talking about the lamb. They'll all be lifting their hand. They'll all be saying, worthy is the lamb, that was, the, the, the one that shed his blood for us. And so she got a homeland where she'll always be welcome. She got a heritage where her bloodline can never be questioned. She is a child of God now. She is one of the chosen, one of the redeemed. She got a bloodline can never be questioned. Nobody can ever look at her again and say, well, you're just a Samaritan. No, I have to look at her and say, I'll tell you what you are. You're a child of the king. She got a heritage that can never be questioned. And she got a husband that will never forsake her because Jesus will never leave her. All the things she didn't get in that life, she now has forever because of Christ. You know what he does? He gives us everything we need and more. I heard this story one day about a son who'd been in the war. I think it was in the Second World War. And uh, they, he was missing in action. No one knew what had happened to him. And then one day, his mother got a phone call. They brought him home, and he's still alive, and he's in the hospital. And they let him speak to his mother. And he said, Mom, he said, I'm, I'm home. He said, I'm so glad to find you. He said, they're going to keep me in the hospital for a little while, and they're going to come home to the house. He said, but Mama, I have a favor to ask. He said, what is it? He said, I've got a friend, and I'd like to bring him home with me. I'd like for him to stay with us. He said, that'd be fine if I'd be wonderful. He said, but Mama, I need to tell you, he's been, he's been injured very badly in the war. He's missing one eye. He's lost an arm and a leg. He began to describe all the injuries and the mother listened. And finally, she said after a long silence, she said, now, son, you're just getting home. You've gone through a lot. It's just been me and your dad and I just don't know if we can handle that. That man coming with me. I didn't handle all the care that he I just don't know if we can do it. And I, I'm sorry, it sounds like I don't want to help him. I just don't know if we can do it. He said, All right, I'll do it. I'm not going to call The next day they called again from the hospital and they said, We're sorry to report to you that your son has died. He said, God. And the man said, Yes, he's crawled out of the third story window in the building. And they went to look at the body. He was missing an eye. Missing an arm. Missing a leg. There wasn't much left of him. He was trying to find out if he would be welcome. Rejoice that Jesus loves us just like we are. That He saved us just like we are. That He'll keep us and never forsake us and never let us go. I want us to rejoice in that. But I also want us to open our eyes and see a lost world that nobody wants. Heaven. In the Bible. 
Preacher, I'm looking at people and they look like they got it all together. That's because you're looking on the surface. 